Well, hi there. I've got babies. Uh, loads of them. Baby bearded dragons. And they're amazing. They're unbelievably adorable. I mean, check these guys out. We got, you'll notice as you see them that some of them have smooth backs. That's an incomplete dominant trait called leather back. Others have spiky backs. That's the, the wild type, uh, which is actually incomplete dominant with scaleless back or, or, or silk back, which is the heterozygote is the one with the leather backs. If you've watched our genetics videos, you probably understand all this already. And uh, it was actually leather back bearded dragons that helped me to understand really what's going on with incomplete dominance. I'd, I'd always learned about it in school, but it never really made sense to me until I was looking at leatherback bearded dragons, which everybody called co-dominant, and they called the, they said that the leatherback was dominant to the spiky back, and that the scaleless silk back was a super dominant. I knew that wasn't a thing. I didn't know how something could be co-dominant with itself, and I was just going, what's going on? And I went, ah. Oh. It was these guys that taught me. Uh, these guys and the the lesser and blue-eyed leucistic ball pythons. They they helped me come to this conclusion. These guys, they're a whole bunch of little tiny babies. That is my second clutch that has hatched so far this year, both out of the same pair of bearded dragons, which are my female Letty, uh, who you've probably seen in our bearded dragon video before. She's a, a slightly orangish, uh, but basically wild type bearded dragon and then my male who is not a wild type at all. He's from Dachiu Bearded Dragons uh, which is a, a business I've been following for more than a decade. I've been interested in them and they're still out there and I finally was able to get one of their dragons. And he is a leatherback, hypo, translucent and hypo and translucent are both recessive and then he's just ridiculously orange on top of that. Ridiculously orange. Anyway, two exciting dragons. And, and bearded dragons tend to have about four clutches a year. So if, if they're gonna lay, they lay four clutches. And, and this little baby here is one of them out of the first clutch that, that she laid this year. These guys, the rest of them here are the second clutch. And this second clutch has been a serious roller coaster ride right from the beginning. Something about bearded dragons is when you pair an adult male and a receptive adult female, if you, if you put them in the same enclosure, they're gonna mate. In fact, this is the second time that I've had bearded dragons occur in my lifetime, but this is the first time I've bred them intentionally. Uh, one time, my friend Kevin and I were both doing a reptile program at his wife's school, and I had my male there and he had his female there, and I don't know when they got together, but a few months later, they had babies. And uh, that female, except for that contact with my male, had never been around a male. But my male was a leatherback, and half the babies were leatherbacks. And so it was pretty clear who the daddy was. What I'm saying is it's not difficult to get male and female bearded dragons to mate with one another. You can tell that your female is getting ready to lay. First off, they get nice and plump, and you can feel the little eggs in there. I am often not very good at like feeling it, how many eggs are in a ball python or things like that. But with bearded dragons, it gets really easy. You can feel the eggs inside of their, inside of their, their abdominal cavity and they make a lot of them, so it's easy. I knew that she was wanting to lay because she started digging a lot. She was trying to dig a nest somewhere in that enclosure and uh, you know, that the enclosure is not set up for her to dig a nest. So it becomes very important to put a lay box in. And the lay box for bearded dragons is basically a, a box like this or, or deeper, full of somewhat moist sand. And, you know, as you might expect, uh, with her first clutch, she promptly laid all of those eggs right next to the lay box. So, uh, that worked out great. She laid 16 total eggs, but only seven of them wound up hatching. And, you know, breeding a whole lot of things, uh, it is not uncommon for the first clutch that a female ever lays in her life to have a lot of unfertilized or, or just otherwise unsuccessful eggs in it. But there were seven, and this is one of those seven, and it hatched out about six or seven weeks ago now. And uh, they're all doing great. 
they're all doing great. Some of them have already been shipped off to their to their new forever homes, and they're wonderful, wonderful little dragons. I've really enjoyed them. But um, about a month later, she started digging again, and, and so I put the lay box back in there. This time, she didn't lay them right next to the lay box. This time, she did something much worse, which is she laid them in the water bowl, and. Uh, this is something that can happen as a breeder. This, this video, you know, I, I, I want to show you some really cool things that can happen, but I also want to tell you some of the terrible things that can happen. And one of the terrible things that can happen is that a female will lay her eggs in the water bowl and the eggs will drown. Now, that was what I feared had happened when I saw all those eggs in the water bowl. I did get a little bit lucky, though. Uh, they'd been digging around a lot that day, and they had knocked a lot of the sand or the water out of the water bowl and a lot of sand into the water bowl. So the water bowl was full of really wet sand, but not really standing water, and the eggs weren't fully submerged. She laid 22 eggs in that water bowl. And, and so I pulled them out and um, I put them in the incubation media, just like I did with the first one. So I, I, you don't really want to incubate them in sand necessarily. You want to incubate them in something like perlite or vermiculite or in, in my case I did some some soil with vermiculite in it and uh, something that'll maintain moisture and not mold over a couple of months while they're incubating at slightly elevated temperatures inside your incubator. And, and so we incubated those eggs because there was a good chance they'd make it and uh, I you know but I was worried I was worried I'd lost the entire clutch. Uh, but of the 22 eggs that she laid in the water bowl 18 of them hatched, uh, and actually only three of them went bad, which, you know, that is something that happens with eggs, is a certain number of them, like we said before, you know, aren't fertilized or or just the, the developing embryo dies before it's ready to hatch. Because one of the unfortunate things, and we talked about this in our spider ball python video, but one of the unfortunate things about sexual reproduction is some of the babies just don't work out. So when you recombine genes, some of the combinations don't work. And three of the eggs died sometime early in development. And they, it was obvious, they weren't anywhere close to hatching. But there was one egg left of the 18, well, of the 19 remaining eggs that hadn't hatched. But it looked good. And so we opened up the egg to see, you know, if the baby died, it had died very close to hatching. And, and we were able to position it so it could get its head out, but there were no signs of life at all. It, it definitely looked like it had died, but it was like, well, you know, if it's got its head out, then it has a chance. And I came back the next morning and looked at that egg and, uh, I mean, it, no real progress. It, it, it looked like it had died. Uh, and so I was, I was planning to feed it to a monitor. That's that's usually what I do with the the uh, eggs that are obvious duds from the get-go and you know if monitors like kinda nasty stuff and so you know this egg hadn't spoiled yet and you know I didn't want to waste waste it but um, the, the baby moved just a tiny bit and so for the first time I thought hey it's alive like you know I, I when I when it first popped out of there I thought this this baby's dead this baby's dead, but it was alive. And uh, so I put it back in the incubator and I gave it, I guess another 24 hours. When I came back 24 hours later, it was most of the way out of the egg, but it looked dead. It looked like it had used up all of its energy getting to that point and it had died. And um, so I, again, it was monitor time and when I picked it up, it opened one of its eyes. So I put it back in the incubator and I, I gave it another day. And the next day I came in and it was all the way out of the egg, but it looked like it had died for sure. I picked it up and again it opened one of its eyes. And so I pulled it out and I thought, well, you know, it is, it's now out of the egg and it definitely looked a little bit underdeveloped. Its eyes were very large, its body, they were closed most of the time. I mean, it, it was super weak, but it was alive. It was alive and I, I was going to give it a chance. And um, the next day I got it to take a little bit of water and I got it to take an assist feed. You know, the other babies had been eating for a few days and this guy definitely, if it was going to survive, it needed to get some energy in its system before it was past the point of no return. And it took that assist feed and um, I mean, it, it started showing 
some signs of improvement. That was the first time that I reported to you about the guy that I named that day, and I named him Runty McGillicuddy. Because he was definitely the runtiest little dragon in the bunch. And, uh, I mean, you know, I was still unconvinced he was going to survive, but he'd made it, and he'd made it a lot farther than I ever expected him to make it. And the next day, I got him out again to make sure he was hydrated and, and to, to try another assist feed, and his energy level was higher. Uh, he still didn't look as good as any of the other dragons did several days prior when they had hatched. But he started to move, and, and at one point I got a little video of him. He ran. Which was the first time that I started to think, you know what? This little failure to thrive dragon, he might make it. This Runty McGillicuddy, he might make it. And, and I, I shared that with you guys, and I was really excited. But the next morning, I went down, and he was weaker. Uh, you know, I was thinking, boy, if he keeps getting ready, getting better at this rate, he might, he might make it. He might make it. But, but the reality is that a lot of times, there's more wrong with them than just not being strong enough to get out of the egg, and that's the reason they were not strong enough to get out of the egg. And, and generally speaking, those babies die inside the egg. But uh, he, he started getting weaker instead of stronger. And, and I can remember that night... That was Wednesday night, you know, I was thinking, I don't think, I don't think he's going to make it. Uh, I honestly felt like I don't think he'll be alive in the morning. And uh, the next morning I went down and, I mean, you know, he was still facing the right way, but you could just tell he was gone. Um, and, and he died. He died. And um, I've been sharing this with a lot of you guys on social media. And a lot of you had, had been upset with the fact that I was originally planning to feed him to a monitor lizard if he didn't make it. And so I, I did what you guys asked me to do and I, I gave him a proper burial instead of feeding him to a monitor. It's, it's hard. It is hard. And that is probably the hardest part about breeding reptiles, or really anything, is just the fact that some of them aren't going to make it. Some of them come out and they're just not... They're not a, a combination of genes that is going to make it. And, you know, uh, you can do your best. And some of them will pull through against all odds, but a lot of them fail to ever thrive. And, and that's something that I think a lot of people that don't breed reptiles are unaware of. You know, they don't know this happens. But this, this is the reason why breeders usually wait a few months or weeks at least before they'll sell you anything. They wait until things are feeding consistently because... Some animals will hatch out of the egg and they will never feed. They'll never even attempt to eat on their own. You know, you can assist feed them forever, but they'll never eat on their own. Some of them won't even assist feed well. You know, and, and you kind of want to make sure that if an animal dies in, in the care of somebody else, that you know that it, was, it wasn't because it was one of the animals that just wasn't going to make it. You know, you know it was well started and ready to go. And because the reality is that some animals just don't have what it takes and it is hard to watch that and you know and it, and it takes some getting used to it. and maybe you never quite get used to it but I was really grateful for the the time I had with Runty McGillicuddy he, he was amazing and and he surprised me over and over and over again and uh, I wish he could have made it but it was a hard experience now the good experience is 18 of his brothers and sisters did make it and they're thriving and before that seven more so he's got 25 siblings so far that have made it and and that was just the second clutch uh, the third clutch amazingly was laid in the lay box uh, there were 20 good eggs one of them was an obvious slug it was just it was soft and the wrong color and and so i fed that one to a monitor the other 19 though are all doing spectacularly well and are due to hatch pretty soon these guys here are now Two weeks old. They hatched two weeks ago today. In fact, yeah, it was exactly two weeks ago that I, I, I brought them home. And uh, this dragon here is just one month older, so he's about six or seven weeks. And I mean, look at the size difference between these two dragons. 
I cannot believe how fast these guys grow. It's amazing, and they, they eat a lot. The fourth clutch is on deck. I can tell, I can feel those eggs inside the female. She's definitely gonna lay a fourth clutch. So, uh, you know, she'll start digging soon and it'll be lay box time again. Hopefully she follows her, her uh, performance on the third clutch and lays this one inside the lay box as well. That's what I'm hoping for. I think I, I did a better job on the third clutch of getting the, the moisture to sand ratio just right. And I think that encouraged her to lay her eggs in the right place. And, uh, you know, we, we've already made this first clutch available to you guys. We're going to make the, the second clutch and, and the, probably the third and fourth as well available to you guys. There are a lot of people who've offered to give them excellent homes. And, you know, I've, I've created an entire Facebook page called Clint's Available Reptiles for those of you that are interested. So, you know, check there for baby bearded dragons. Also, I'm going to have ball pythons and crested geckos and a lot of other cool things this year. So just be checking in there. If a, if a Clint's reptiles, reptile is the right pet reptile for you, um, for the first time ever, they're going to be available to you. Thank you guys for coming with me on this journey. And I, I really appreciate those of you that had comforting words at the time when, uh, you know, I was, I was trying to help Renty McGillicuddy make it and, and, and when it became obvious that he wouldn't and when we lost him. You know, that it was really nice to have your guys' support and just how kind you guys all were about it and how understanding. Because that's, that's one of the things that I fear that we don't understand often in the reptile community is that animals do die sometimes, you know, and sometimes it's completely unavoidable. Like when we breed them, you know, it, it, it's much worse than it, when it's a mistake, you know, and, and sometimes we do make mistakes and, and people really beat themselves up about it. This channel exists hopefully to help you avoid making as many mistakes as possible. But I'm, I'm grateful that we have a community where we can support each other instead of tearing each other down. And so I'm thankful for each and every one of you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you for being there for each other. Thank you for teaching each other in a kind and understanding way instead of tearing each other down. None of us know everything. We all are, are learning. We all are going to make mistakes and, and let's learn together. So uh, as always, like and subscribe. Uh, make sure to click the little bell so you can get notifications. Maybe, maybe we'll do some updates on these guys and other animals we produce. If you're wondering if a, a bearded dragon is the right pet reptile for you, make sure you check out our video on bearded dragons because they're certainly not for everyone. But, it, you know, if you have the budget and the space and the time for a bearded dragon, they're just amazing pet reptiles. And we hope to see you real soon. Getting bearded dragons, oh, you're a grumpy, you're a grumpy little guy. He's this guy here. He's just getting to the age where he's old enough to be grumpy. The little ones, uh, they don't even think about being grumpy at all. But he's just old enough to be grumpy. And because I've got so many of them, I haven't been handling him a lot. And so he's not used to it. Plus, he just had a car ride. It's a little bit of an intense day. So we'll, we'll be understanding it, this grumpy little dude. But he's a grumpy little dude, aren't you? Aren't you? These handfuls of baby dragons. Look at them. They're so cute. Oh, my God. They are really cute. I love them. Oh, good cat. I had to catch. <laughs> I think I got that on film. <laughs> <laughs> Was it so filmy?